a truly execrable, and I love saying the word execrable, uh, figure from recent American history, Donald Rumsfeld once uh, categorized knowledge into known knowns, unknown knowns, and unknown unknowns, uh, or words to that effect. Basically, you know, there are some things you know, you know about other things that you don't know that you don't know yet. And then there are things you don't even know are out there that you don't know. And I'm gonna add another category, which is things you know, you think you know, but are wrong. And when it comes to the Russia story, all four categories, Rumsfeld's three plus mine, I think have applied in a lot of the coverage and trying to make sense of it. I know what I know. I know what I think I know. I know what I don't know, and I know that a lot of other people are wrong. So uh, I count on my next guest to help me make sense of it. She's been on the program before. Marcy Wheeler is uh, a writer on national security matters. She can be found at emptywheel.net. And when it comes to this Russia story, I know when I don't know something, it's probably time to talk to Marcy. So Marcy, thanks for coming back on the program. Thanks for having me. Okay, and there's so much that I kind of think I don't know um, about this, about what's been going on lately. But one of the things that uh, struck a lot of people in the last week was the very bizarre round of uh, television appearances by a fellow named Nunberg, Sam Nunberg, uh, having been uh, subpoenaed by uh, Robert Mueller. Uh, what do we know about Mueller and what should we know? About Nunberg? I'm sorry, about, about Nunberg, yeah. <laughs> See how confused yeah. I'm getting? See how messed up I am? <laughs> We're out of the gate. We're already confused. Yeah. Um, so Nunberg was a um, Trump campaign staffer way back in the Neanderthal days, if the entire campaign can't be called such, of the campaign um, back in early, mid-2015 and then got fired. And he did an interview with Mueller about two weeks ago now, and it, pretty much as soon as he walked out of the interview, it was a voluntary interview, Mueller slapped him with a grand jury subpoena and he will uh, testify on Friday. And that suggests either that Mueller thinks he was not truthful or that there was something he said in his interview that Mueller wants to get on the record before the grand jury, which of course indicts people. So uh, I suspect it's kind of a combination of the two. He had his meltdown on Monday, uh, basically as he sat down trying to pull emails for 10 enumerated people um, it includes Trump and Hope Hicks and um, Michael Cohen, and those are kind of the White House people, but it also includes Steve Bannon, with whom Nunberg is still quite close, and uh, Roger Stone. Can I say that R word here? Ro uh, yes, I will let <laughs> you get away with it, yeah. Yeah, so uh, Roger Stone, classic rap going back to Nixon. Oh, no, you can't say that one, but we'll edit it out. <laughs> Uh, um, we'll edit but, it out. Okay. But um, <laughs> it's the technical term. But anyway, I know. So, so um, Nunberg considers him a mentor, and he sat down, started looking at the emails he'd have to turn over in response to the subpoena. And instead of doing that, he went and spent about eight hours on cable TV, pretty much melting down and saying, "I can't believe I've been subpoenaed. I, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it." Until, and here's the irony, is that he was fired for using the N-word uh, to speak of an African-American woman. This is way back in 2015. And um, he went on MSNBC and one of their guests, African-American lawyer, talked him through the importance of showing up in response to a grand jury subpoena. So he will show up on, on Friday, will have shown up on Friday. And, um, you know, the, the irony of a very, very smart African-American woman talking this racist into basically saving his life by actually showing up for the grand jury. You know, uh, irony upon ironies. But first of all, for those who uh, who heard Marcy bleeped out, the word was rascal, the R word. <laughs> uh, secondly, OK, num secondly, for number people were, I think, fascinated and fixated, understandably, perhaps, on his very public meltdowns and were I to be uh, 
only able to say one sentence at Sam Nunberg. I think it would be, we realized we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable. But that aside, uh, you know, there's, you have a good, uh, I, I think some ideas. We won't know. We're pre-recording this interview. Friday, he will presumably appear, uh, but we won't know what he said. So, um, unless we get an indictment Friday afternoon, then we'll know. Well, then we, then we'll, perhaps we will, but likely we won't. Um, so, but you had some thoughts about, uh, what might've triggered this response from Mr. Mueller and what, uh, what uh, Mr. Nunberg might have to say. Well, Nunberg seems to think he um, he was trying to protect Roger Stone and not showing up on Friday. So Stone and Bannon are the two people he cares about. In some of his meltdowns, he said, I hate Donald Trump, I don't care about him. It's uh, Bannon and Stone that I'm trying to protect. So something he said to Mueller in that interview two weeks ago um, Mueller wants him to repeat to the grand jury. Nunberg thinks it has to do with WikiLeaks. And after the day after uh, Nunberg's meltdown, Stone then went on um, uh, Meet the Press Daily or whatever it's called, MTP, and um, made some interesting non-denial denials. He kind of focused on WikiLeaks and not knowing and not having spoken to WikiLeaks and briefly mentioned Gooserfer 2.0, who is another player in this whole hack and leak thing. And his responses on Gooserfer 2.0 were far less convincing and far less uh, categorical than his responses on WikiLeaks. So it may be that Nunberg believes he's protecting Stone on WikiLeaks, and in fact, he's gonna go in and damn Stone on something having to do with Gooserfer. So let me ask you, because, and, 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 you know, I recognize this is a you know, complex legal question, but as I sort of get through what the potential crimes might be here uh, that Mueller is pursuing, um, one of the potential crimes I get clearly would be, you know, illegally accepting election assistance from a foreign government, but Wiki, for example, to take a file from WikiLeaks uh, and publish it, I, would that be a crime? Uh, to take a file from a presumably non-state actor or somebody you believed to be a non-state actor, would that be a crime? Well, I hope not because I do that all the time. Right. Um, the distinction, so Stone in his denials kept focusing on whether WikiLeaks is a Russian cutout. And he said, you know, the, the notion of treason all depends on whether or not WikiLeaks is a cutout for Russia. I don't believe they are. Um, he, he sort of ignored the whole Guccifer question. Um, and importantly, he said, I don't, I don't now believe that Guccifer hacked the DNC but it's clear that when he had conversations with Guccifer 2.0 in August, starting in August of 2016, and by the way, he's he's kind of fudged his dates on this uh, for his Hipsy testimony. He got the dates wrong, so he he fudged them again. Um, I meet the press earlier this week. He you know said it was later than it was, but what's clear is that when he spoke to Guccifer 2.0 in August of 2016, he did believe that Guccifer had hacked the DNC. He's now saying he doesn't believe that, but when he spoke with him, he, he did believe, he had just written an article saying, hey, cool, you hacked the DNC, but you're not Russian, so it's all cool. Mm -hmm. um, if he then worked with Guccifer 2.0 on forward leaking other things he obtained, or in anticipating where he was going with what Guccifer 2.0 was dealing, that's when you get into a problem regardless of whether uh, he can be proven to know that Guccifer 2.0 is, was, as the IC claims, working for Russia or, in fact, Russian. So, you know, even before you get into foreign actors and illegal campaign donations, it could be something as simple as conspiracy to commit computer fraud and abuse act. Okay, that's interesting. And would it be, uh, when we talk about foreign actors, for example, the uh, Mueller indictment that uh, that identifies the 13 Russian players, the, the, the bot farms and so on, troll farms, would it be illegal 
to collaborate in a non, I, I'm trying to think of the word, non-corporeal way, you know, this is all digital stuff, mm -hmm. with Russians if there's no clear-cut evidence they're working for the government? What the um, troll farm indictment, actually both the troll farm indictment and the, the DC Manafort indictment charge the same crime as, as what I call their backbone. It's a uh, conspiracy to defraud the United States. The Manafort charge is based on Manafort not permitting the State Department and DOJ to manage foreign agents. Basically, by they're saying that Manafort was working for Ukraine when it was run by a Russian backed uh, by Yanukovych, basically. And he was working for Yanukovych, but hiding that fact. And by hiding the fact from the government entities here in the United States that regulate these things, he was defrauding the United States of its ability to uh, to prevent outside actors from from participating without disclosure. The, the charge is the same thing against the troll farm. It, it's a different it's a different entity. They're, they're saying he that the troll farm deprived FEC of uh, regulating foreign actors, that by not registering, by hiding the fact that they were Russian of any sort from the FEC, it prevented the FEC from preventing donations and in-kind support and so on and so forth. So both of the charges are the same. Um, and I've and I've said that, for example, I think a lot of what Jared Kushner has done in negotiations with foreign governments, you could see a very parallel conspiracy to defraud the United States there too. Basically, by hiding who you're working for, it deprives the United States of being able to do the things it needs to do to protect itself from outside actors. So and, that, uh, and just to uh, jump in for a second, um, that's very helpful. First of all, thank you, Marcy Wheeler. But secondly. Uh, it, it also, especially I would say the Manafort indictment, to a certain extent cuts to the heart of the way a lot of people in here in Washington, D.C. do business, right? Because uh, even though we're talking about Russia right now, this sort of undeclared range of activities that people like Manafort uh, have been doing on behalf of Ukraine, uh, uh, many other people are doing on behalf of other countries, as well as Ukraine, perhaps, and Russia, and uh, if we start and Turkey and Saudi Arabia, and et cetera, Qatar, and Israel, Qatar, yeah. UAE. And, right. and let's talk about the UAE for a second, because now we learn that uh, Mueller has as a person of interest in his investigation, uh, an advisor to the United Arab Emirates, uh, Mr. Nader and no Democrats don't get excited. It's not Ralph. But um, the the. Uh, so I believe his name is Nader, George Nader. George Nader. Yeah. Yes. Uh, um, so again, uh, uh, now what does that say? Because we've been hearing a lot about Russia, but it appears to suggest that uh, that Mueller is widening his net to include any other foreign actor who might have assisted Trump. Sort of, although the Nader allegation is that Nader brokered. Um, meetings with the Emirates that were in themselves a back channel to Russia. So mm. if you recall, Jared Kushner met with um, the head of a sanctioned bank in December and the bank has said, uh, guy, the guy's name is Sergey Gorkov. The bank had said, oh yeah, we were meeting with Kushner in business terms, not in foreign policy terms, suggesting that Kushner was entertaining the notion of a loan his family's business is, is deeply underwater, especially 666 Fifth Avenue. Um, so suggesting that they were talking funding. And after that meeting, there was a subsequent meeting in the Seychelles with, with um, Eric Prince, the head of uh, the Arab Emirates, and this guy, George Nader, who's this kind of Middle Eastern power broker. And that was meant to set up a back channel to Russia then there was a subsequent meeting. Sorry, I may have this wrong. There was another meeting with the head of the Arab Emirates uh, in Trump Tower that importantly, um, the transition team hid from the Obama administration. So normally when, you know, when a head of state comes to the United States, they tell the government um, that was hidden. And so this is, this is a similar kind of thing where Jared was conducting meetings during the transition period while hiding 
information that should have been disclosed to then the government of the United States, which was the Obama administration. And I think that in hiding that meeting, you may get to the con fraud us, which is my shorthand for the conspiracy to defraud the United States. Um, and it was all done for two reasons. Uh, one is to set up a back channel with Russia. And the second one is to, um, the, I, I sort of think of what Jared has been doing um, in terms of a quote unquote, and I do mean squ- scare quotes here, peace plan, you know, quote peace, quote plan, um, to uh, for the Middle East. So ostensibly he is trying to solve the Israeli-Palestinian uh, crisis or whatever you want to call it. And instead, what he's really talking about is giving Israel what it's what it wants, including importantly moving moving the uh, U.S. embassy to Jerusalem, which is going to cause all sorts of trouble starting in May when it happens. Um, giving Saudi Arabia what they want, giving the Emirates what they want, starting a war with Iran, whether or not he realizes that's what's going to happen. And you need Russia in that calculation because you need to convince Russia to kind of. Um, buy into some kind of peace plan for Syria, which is, by the way, one of the first things that Trump uh, turned to doing in the transition period was working with Russia on Syria. And then you need to convince the Russians to give up on Iran and let Iran basically be run over by by this quote unquote peace plan. So that's that's how you might think of it. And it's basically this 30 something year old kid who does, who's way out of his depth, as you said, There are these reports of four, but it's really six countries that know they're taking advantage of both Kushner's inexperience and his indebtedness. And they're convincing him to buy off on this quote piece, quote plan that's nothing of the sort. um, And it's going to lead down a terrible path, I think. So Jared Kushner, you think, was trying to broker a peace plan and borrow a lot of money at the same time uh, while simultaneously having his business at 666, uh, that's Mark of the Beast, 666 Fifth Avenue. Uh, you can't make this stuff up. Um, yeah. And unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. There's so much more I, I would want to ask you, but I know you're, uh, you're following this stuff closely, and I know that uh, with every day that passes, it seems there, there are new revelations. So once again, Marcy Wheeler, uh, thanks for tracking these these crazy stories and thanks for coming on the program. Awesome. Thank you.